This is Paris. The great bells of Notre Dame Cathedral chiming across this timeless town, echoing from the River Seine up to the hill of Montmartre and across to the tip of the Eiffel Tower. And this, too, is Paris. Yep. A boy and a girl in love, in a handsome cab, clip-flopping through the Bois de Boulogne in the pink dawn of a Paris summer. And this... The cabarets, the nightclubs, the popping of champagne corks, and the swirl of dancing skirts. Yes, all these are Paris. But none is exactly Paris. For Paris is many things to many people. It's a two-headed chicken by Picasso for an artist. It's Madame Curie or Victor Hugo, Balzac and Marcel Proust to a writer or a student. Paris is a highly personal place. Each of us has painted his own portrait of Paris. This is mine. CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, one man's portrait of Paris. The man, David Schoenbrunn, CBS foreign correspondent, winner of this year's Overseas Press Club Award for the best reporting from abroad, and author of the forthcoming book, As France Goes. If any American knows how France goes and why, it is this veteran Paris correspondent who has been reporting the news from Paris ever since the liberation 12 years ago this summer. Yet he remains objective, an American observer with an American wife, and as we shall see, a very American daughter, even though she is a native-born Parisienne. We take you now by tape to Paris and David Schoenbrunn. This is Paris, oldest, best known, least understood capital in the world. This is a city of contradictions, where every valid generalization has an opposite which is equally valid. It is the gayest, saddest, most sinful, and most virtuous of cities. Paris is communist and Catholic. It is a rich city inhabited by a great number of poor people. Paris is as young as atomic energy, as old as Caesar's legions. It is both cosmopolitan and provincial, with an international core surrounded by a group of little villages. It is a city open to all, but accepting none, with one exception, its children. Paris is a great city for children, as you will hear from one of them. You've got to live here and have children to learn this secret side of Paris, a secret which is a key to France itself. From the children and from the way they treat their children, you can learn more about France and the French than from a library of books. I am sitting on a bench in the Champ de Mars, a lovely green park lying between the Eiffel Tower and the École Militaire just one of the dozens of perfumed floral bouquets that the people of Paris have offered to their children to keep them out of the crowded, dirty streets of a modern city. A part of Paris few foreigners know and few tourists ever get to visit. A sand pile for kids, a carousel, hidden away among the trees, only a few yards from the Eiffel Tower. A group of little girls is dancing right near me. They've locked hands in a circle, and they're singing an old French song. Let's move a little closer and listen. Dansons la capucine, y'a pas de pain chez nous, y'a nage la voisine. Let's dance the capucine. We have no bread at home. Our neighbor has bread, but there is none for us. Our neighbor has bread, but not for us. That's very French, you know, very sad but very true. In a nation that has suffered foreign invasions, civil wars or revolutions every generation for hundreds of years. These people and their children 
have learned the hard way, the bitter reality of the expression, every man for himself, or as the French put it, chacun pour soi. This is really the basis of what is called French individualism. France, for almost 2,000 years, has been the crossroads of a dangerous world, and each child has learned from its father how to survive in that dangerous world. And France has survived, and Paris has become the oldest capital city of the West, so there must be some wisdom in their lessons to their children. The kids seem to love it. I'd like you to meet one of the children who's dancing and singing in that group right near us. She is nine years old, born and raised in Paris. Her name is Lucy. She is my daughter, and she's very much a part of what Paris means to me and what I've learned about Paris from her. Lucy, Lucy, viens ici. Hello, Dad, what do you want? Well, Lucy, you know, I told you I was going to do this radio report about Paris, and that's what I'm doing now. And I thought maybe I'd ask you. After all, you were born in Paris, weren't yes. you? Yes. Um, what do you think about Paris? Well, I like Paris because whenever you look outside, you see green trees, grass, flowers everywhere. And you like this park here? Yes, I like it. It's just like a park. Uh, how about going to school here? Do you like school? Oh, yes, very much. Why? Oh, uh, I like my friends. Now, what about school? You know, you work pretty hard in school here. Do you like that? Yes, I, I think it's better than working less the way you and Mommy told me. Because uh, when you get out of school, you have more in your head than, than uh, when you get out of school in America. You have less. Well, that's a pretty French idea, Lucy. Now, tell me, are you a French girl or are you an American girl? Well, I'm American. There's no reason why I shouldn't be American. Because you, my mother, and grandpa and grandma are American. The rest of the family, too. And that doesn't matter at all to your French friends. They don't make fun oh, of no, you at all. never, never. They, sometimes they recognize recommend they even sort of, uh, like, forget about that I'm American. Uh-huh. Well, you run back and play with them now, darling. Tout à l'heure, huh? All right. Bon. Tout à l'heure. No, it doesn't matter that Lucy is American. And that is a very Parisian attitude. The people and the children of this city respect each other's individual personalities and opinions. We Americans are always telling our children when they go out to play or to parties now, be good, Johnny. The French say, sois sage, mon enfant. Be wise, my child. That's very French and very good advice. They feel that you must raise your child with the knowledge that the world is not a perfect place. They try to show their children the difference between right and wrong, good and evil, but they don't constantly admonish them to be good. The French hope for the best and advise their kids to be wise. I talked about this just a few moments ago with the mother of one of Lucy's friends, Madame Mestralet, and this is what she told me. It is our duty as parents to protect, feed, educate our children. It is their duty to honor and obey their parents. You Americans like to say, you are only w young ones, and by that you mean, I think, that children should do as they please, not be frustrated. We French put it differently. You are only young for a very short time. You have most of your life to do as you please. So during your brief use, you should do as you are told, study hard, obey orders, for soon you will be grown up and be able to give orders. So youth should stay in its place, the French believe. Is this good? Is this bad? I don't know. The older I get, the more I live in Paris, the less sure I am about many things. And that also is a part of the story of Paris, for this is a city of doubt, of intellectual curiosity and soul searching. I'd like you to hear about that from a Parisian friend of mine, the editor of one of France's most influential newspapers, unofficial spokesman for Mendes France. Let's leave the park and the kids now and go to the editorial rooms of the Paper Express on the Champs-Élysées and meet its editor, Jean-Jacques Servan-Schreiber. Taxi! Taxi! 91 Champs-Élysées, s'il vous plaît. Oui, monsieur, 91 Champs-Élysées. The individualism and anarchy of the French comes out in full flower behind the wheel of a car. 
and Paris taxi drivers are a special species of humans, the most ornery, irritable, and yet stimulating of men. They growl and grumble at their fares. They drive like suicidal maniacs, but with great skill. They curse all pedestrians and policemen and are cursed back at with equal vehemence. The myth of French politeness, and I wonder whoever invented that legend, is soon dispelled by a cab driver. But you can get a valuable insight into the French mind by talking to cabbies. It's one of my favorite sports in Paris. The other night, I was in a cab coming home from the CBS studio. It was about midnight in Paris, and I noticed that when we came along to one crossing where there was a red light, my driver simply slowed down a little bit and continued right through the red light. I rapped on the glass, leaned over and said to him, now, why did you do that? Why didn't you stop for that light? He turned around to me and he said, Monsieur, have you ever thought what a red light was there for? He said, a red light is just a machine, Monsieur. It operates mechanically, and the whole purpose of it is to stop traffic in one direction to allow traffic to go by in the opposite direction. Now, Monsieur, I am a man, not a machine. I don't have to have some automatic signal up there tell me whether it's safe to go or not. It's midnight in Paris now, said the driver. There are no cars around, and I slowed down. I looked carefully to the right, to the left, and I saw there were no other cars. What would you have me do, he asked. Just sit there like a dumb machine and wait for that other machine to change and tell me what to do? No, monsieur. I am a man, not a machine. Well, I must confess that I was very excited by that description. It, it means all of France and all of Paris to me. It's all that is good in this country and all that is bad at the same time. For this is really a country of contradictions. The individual spirit of the French has permitted them to overcome disasters through 2,000 years of their history. It also prevents them from ever getting the kind of community which perhaps would present, prevent some of these disasters from coming about. Sometimes I don't know whether these things are good or bad. I can only say that intellectually, I am thrilled by a man who says to me, I am a man and not a machine. We're going to meet another man now who is a man and not a machine. The man we're about to meet, Jean-Jacques Servan Schreiber, is always right in the middle of a storm of some kind or other. Jean-Jacques, today at 32 years of age, is the youngest editor of a major Paris newspaper. He is a brilliant man, but a tortured intellectual. And in that sense, he reflects two of the qualities of his native city of Paris, the most brilliant and tortured capital of Western Europe. Voici quatre manches Champs-Élysées, monsieur. Well, here we are at the Paper Express. Monsieur Servan Schreiber, s'il vous plaît. Vous avez rendez-vous? Oui, Monsieur Schönbrunn. Bon, vous voulez vous montrer par ici, monsieur. Hello, David. Please sit down. Thank you, Jean-Jacques. As I told you on the telephone earlier this morning, I wanted to introduce you to some of my American listeners to show them what I think is a typical Parisian. Uh, Jean-Jacques, you run a very important weekly newspaper here, and I, you're considered one of the spokesmen for Mendes France, although I know you deny it all the time. Uh, but I've noticed in all the years I've known you, your paper and the way you run it, the way you eat your lunches out of trays, is very, very American. How come a Parisian and a real Frenchman like yourself is so American? Because I've, I've been to America several times, and uh, my experience is that the Americans are better journalists than the French people. So each time I can take my lessons from American publishers, I do it. And I've always found myself the better for it. But you then believe that it's important to borrow American techniques. Now, what about a way of life and an intellectual attitude towards things? Are you Parisian or American in that respect? Well, if you mean, David, that I, whether I prefer to live in Paris or would I like to live in America, I prefer to live in Paris. Uh, each time I go to America, I feel very much uh, at ease, and I like being in America. I, these days and in the, last, in the recent years, I seldom agree with the State Department with the foreign policy of America, but that, that, that has never interfered with my great love of the way of life in America. Well, I wasn't really talking about way of life or where you live. I was, I was thinking of your approach to your work. Uh, you have an American technique in making your paper. What would you describe as the Parisian about you? What is the thing that you think distinguishes a young French intellectual like yourself from an American counterpart in general? 
Well, maybe it would be very pretentious to say so, but I think we are less prejudiced on uh, many problems. I think we as French journalists or French young people in politics, we ask ourselves more questions that, than our American friends. For instance, take a very difficult subject, a delicate one like communism. Uh, we don't classify it as easily as the Americans do. We try more perhaps to understand it, to see what is the future of it. Uh, what will be the European future towards communism. And we are not so, I would say, perhaps, we are not so satisfied as the Americans are with our own explanations. Would you say then that you believe that the essence of being Parisian in the sense of French culture and civilization is the universalism of French thought, the openness, the curiosity, uh, the ever-seeking and constant doubt and examination, which is so French? Well, yes, I would say some more intellectual instability, which is a good thing. Uh -huh. Makes yourself ask, ask more questions, you see. Yes, and nonconformism. Well, that would be pretentious to say so. I, I don't think the Americans are conformists, but we are uh, more ill at ease, so we are seeking more, perhaps. Jean-Jacques, uh, would you care to say anything about uh, Mendes and what you think the future of Mendes France is in this country? Well, as you say, David, I'm not his spokesman. Well, now, what's your You'll opinion? You'll have to go and see him. <laughs> what's your opinion, your personal opinion? These days, I have no opinion. I mean, it's very difficult, and I don't think it's the problem of one man. I think the crisis now is much larger than the problem of one man. It is indeed. Thank you very much, Jean-Jacques. On l'appelle Mademoiselle de Paris, et sa Mademoiselle de Paris, so chic, so elegant. The envy of every woman of fashion in the world, and yet, another Parisian paradox, you see more Paris gowns in New York or London, Rio or Berlin, than you see in Paris. For the haute couture, one of Paris's most important industries, is mainly an export business, a big business, quietly, elegantly conducted, as the new fashions are shown to buyers from all over the world. Good luck, peace. Numéro 55, suivez-moi. Number 55, follow me. Numéro 78. This is the showroom Poker of one of Monta. France's great Number fashion designers, one of the great designers Poker of the world, Monta. Pierre Balmain. And the voice you've just heard announcing the numbers in his latest collection is that of a great friend of mine. Her name is Jeanette Spanier. If there's anybody who means Paris and is Paris through and through, it's Jeanette. Yes, David, I am Parisian through and through. And yet, you know, I feel completely English. And that's one of the joys of Paris, is that nobody seems to think it at all strange that one of the great French couture houses should have British directress with a British passport. I've kept my British passport, I feel terribly British, and yet I feel completely Parisian with all that that name means. Now, what does it mean to you, Jeanette? It means being able to work here easily, live as I feel like living, with great freedom of mind and spirit. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Jeanette, do you think it's Pierre in? I'm sure that he'd love to speak to you. I'll, um, oh, there he is, coming in at the door right now. Monsieur Balmain, Monsieur Balmain, vous voulez venir ici une minute, s'il vous plaît? Oui. Hello, David. What are you doing here today? Well, Pierre, as usual, giving you some free publicity. <laughs> Thank you very much. Pierre, I'm here doing a show about Paris for the CBS radio workshop. And what I'm doing really is describing my Paris. Sounds funny for me to come here to tell you about my Paris, but really, Jeanette and you, among my many friends here, this wonderful, graceful house of yours, this is part of my Paris, too. And you, Pierre, one of the great figures of Paris. And I'd like to ask you a very simple and yet a very complicated question. Pierre, you're a Parisian. What does it mean to be a Parisian? Well, you know, David, I wasn't born in Paris. I was born very far away in France, but in the Alps, in the mountains of Savoy. I had never been in Paris. I came to Paris for the first time when I was 19. I was coming to study at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts to be an architect. That was my first contact with Paris, and fortunately, I was taken by some friends through the subway from the station to the Place de la Concorde at 8 o'clock at night. All the fountains had the lights on, 
and the obelisk and uh, the Arc de Triomphe in the distance, I stood in the middle of that square for the first time and I had tears in my eyes and I decided that I wanted to become a Parisian and I have never left Paris since that time. Thank you for talking to us today, Pierre Balma and Ginette Spanier. Thus, the Paris of fashion, of politics, of children, well, it's only one of the Parises. There's the Paris of song. Certainly, no city in the world has ever been the subject of as many songs as Paris. For Paris is a woman, eternal woman, beloved mistress of all men everywhere. Here is Paris seen through the rose-colored glasses of Edith Piaf. And here is the Paris of Maurice Chevalier. Paris, je t'aime, je t'aime, je t'aime, avec tendresse, mieux qu'une maîtresse, depuis le temps qu'on s'est rencontré. Paris, on ne s'est jamais abandonné. À Buenos Aires, à Londres ou au Caire, le cœur plein de flammes, j'ai chanté des femmes, tout en moi est à toi pour toujours. <rire> oui, enfin, tout ce qui me reste, quoi. Paris, je t'aime. Oh, tu parles d'amour. And Jacqueline Francoise, Paris, Paris After Dark. Paris la nuit, au oh merveilleux Paris. Dans les rues, dans les cours, Paris attend. Paris la nuit, la nuit sans un bruit. Quelques millions d'âmes cherchant le repos des hommes, des femmes, des petits poules beaux. Paris toujours, le Paris des amours. Et celui des serments, le Paris des amants. À nation, venez l'étoile. Paris d'or à la belle étoile. Et tout est si joli. Lorsque dort Paris la nuit. A Parisian is someone who loves Paris and who loves life. By that definition, there must be hundreds of millions of Parisians in the world. For millions of visitors come here every year, and most of them love Paris, as did their fathers and their grandfathers. For Paris, Paris has been a mecca of the Western world for centuries. Not only for expatriates, but more importantly, for patriots. For men who love their own countries best of all, but who found room in their hearts to love Paris too. Men from all walks of life. Statesmen, writers and painters, businessmen, scientists and philosophers. All have found new inspiration here in Paris without ever losing their own originality, their own nationality. Picasso, the Spaniard, Modigliani, the Italian, Marie Curie, the Pole, Karl Marx and Lenin, Leibniz and James Joyce. No more typically American novel has ever been written than James Farrell's Studs Lonergan. It was written here in Paris. Surely there's no more homespun American folk song than Home Sweet Home. It was composed here in Paris. And surely no greater American patriot ever loved his country more than Thomas Jefferson. Well, the day that Thomas Jefferson left Paris, where he had been our ambassador, to return home to become President George Washington's Secretary of State, this is what Thomas Jefferson wrote in his diary. He said, The hospitality of Paris is beyond anything I had conceived to be practicable in a large city. 
Their eminence, too, in science, the ease and vivacity of their conversation give a charm to their society to be found nowhere else. Ask any traveled inhabitant of any nation, in what country on earth would you rather live? Certainly my own, where are all my friends, my relations, and the earliest, sweetest affections and recollections of my life. Which would be your second choice? France. Thus wrote Thomas Jefferson in the summer of 1789, just a few weeks after the storming of the Bastille, the birth of the French Revolution. Many other men have since echoed or paraphrased those words of Jefferson. Every man has two countries, his own and France. And when you say France, you mean Paris, for Paris is the heart and soul of France. You are listening to the great organ of Notre Dame Cathedral, Our Lady of Paris, and the music that thrills the souls of free men everywhere, La Marseillaise, here on this island of the Cité, where Paris was born more than 2,000 years ago. Here, where this 800-year-old cathedral stands, was once a Roman temple. Before that, the shrine of a tribe called the Parisii, an obscure tribe who've lived in history by giving their name to this little island. Here in the vast shadows of this great church, the men of the terror during the revolution tore down the crucifix, erected an altar to the god of reason. Here, too, Napoleon crowned himself emperor. And here, only 12 years ago this summer, as thousands of worshippers knelt in prayer, thanking God for the liberation of their beloved city, a German sniper fired from a lofty balcony and panic swept the crowd as they sought cover. One man, the man they were aiming at, remained calm, quiet, and erect. A tall, thin, doer man, General Charles de Gaulle. His voice reverberated throughout this ancient temple, Francais debout! Frenchmen, up on your feet. Frenchmen, on your feet. The world needs you. The world loves you. The world, I think, would indeed be a sorry place without France, without Paris. This is David Schoenbrunn reporting from Paris and returning you now to the CBS Radio Workshop in Hollywood. You have been listening to the CBS Radio Workshop, which tonight has presented transcribed Portrait of Paris by David Schoenbrunn, CBS Paris correspondent. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced in Hollywood by William N. Robeson. Hugh Douglas speaking. Next week, at the same time, the workshop will present from New York the case of the White Kitten, a satire on modern mystery stories. Interested in earning extra money easily? Let improved Series E bonds earn it for you now. Series E bonds earn more money in less time than ever before. And now they pay back $4 for every three in less than 10 years. You can hold your bonds 10 additional years at the same high interest, too. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these same stations by My Son Jeep.